your need to act like you don't need anything is stopping the flow of the miracle working power of God in your life. If you would say, Lord, I'm hungry. He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. For the purpose of our understanding tonight, let us not just compartmentalize need to money. Because it is possible to have needs in other areas. And sometimes money gets such a center stage as it relates to need because we have come through such struggle historically that it is almost a given that there is a financial need and if you do have a need, my God shall supply. But the reality is some of the things that, that is slowing you down, hindering you, are needs in other area the need for support, the need for validation, the need for love, the need for companionship, the need for connectivity, the need for staffing for your business, the need for a building for your vision, the, the need, see, see it's a, it wasn't that they were just handing out ducats all the time. If you're hungry, the need might be bread. If you're thirsty, it might be water. If you're lonely, it might be help. But whatever your need is, you have to fill that in because the Lord told me to tell you he is the master of your need. He is the master of your need. Your need has not shocked him. It has not embarrassed him. It has not intimidated him. In fact, he is in control not only of what he supplies, but he is in control of, of your need. Touch your neighbor and say, he's the master of my need. Now let's pray over the word. Sanctify it down in our hearts and in our spirits and cause us to understand more abundantly, Lord, uh, what you would speak tonight. I know what you downloaded into me. L let it be released in this place in a coherent, effective way that it, that it gives illumination and light and understanding. I feel as though that I'm about to feed a feeder. I'm about to feed a feeder. I, I, as I release what is in my spirit tonight, somebody's going to take it and do like the body does with food. They're going to convert it into so many nutritious elements that are going to minister to them. It's going to go in a sermon. It's going to come out a building. It's going to go in a sermon. It's going to come out a husband. It's going to go in a... Y'all are not ready for this. It's going to go in a sermon. It's going to come out a degree. It's going to go in a sermon. It's going to come out property. It's going to go in the word that I speak to you right now. Your spirit is going to take it just like your body does food. And it's going to convert it into the thing you need for what is about to happen next in your life. If you can understand what I just said, praise him on credit. Just die. You may be seated. You may be seated. I was having lunch with some close friends and people I've known for a number of years and we were reminiscing about years ago when we were uh, in a little storefront back in Montgomery, West Virginia and uh, Bishop Watkins was uh, coming down to minister and, and, uh, and I needed, he had so many members, he brought four or five busloads, about 20 cars down, I had about 30 members and uh, 
I ended up going to the high school, I think, there in Montgomery and renting the auditorium at the high school to hold the crowd because my church, which would seat about 120 people, wouldn't hold the crowd. <clears throat> and I thought to myself how that aligned with a conversation I had had with God. I said, God, I am the same man and the same preacher with the same anointing that I had back then. Why didn't you give me American Airlines back then? I'm the same guy. I was younger, I was stronger, I was hungry. Why, why do you take us through stages of development? Why, why do you let us exercise in the gymnasium of small beginnings and go from 30 to 60 to 100 fold? Because sometimes we can get stuck at a stage and never evolve to the capacity that we need to evolve to receive what we need to receive. And as I began to talk to the Lord about it, he said, you see, I supply need. Isn't it amazing how you can come to church with somebody and you can really get blessed and the person you brought with you got nothing? Have you ever rode home from church with somebody who got nothing and you were really, really blessed and they got in the car talking about who was cute and who was fine and who had gained weight and why did she wear those shoes with that dress and, and you're going crazy because you're having a spiritual moment with the Lord and they seemingly got nothing. How could there be so much supply of glory and they be oblivious to it? Have you ever recognized that everybody doesn't have the same capacity? that they could be exposed to great things and not have an appetite for them. That's why you, you don't need, you need to evolve from needing to do a census before you evolve. That is to say, you don't need everybody on your road to line up with you for you to receive what you need from God. You don't need a reaction from other people to validate what you need from God because there can come a release on such a level that if you don't have the capacity to receive it, you might not even know it happened. My God. In our text, Paul says, I, I needed something and you came and ministered unto my necessity when other churches didn't. Unto my necessity when other churches didn't. I thought, this is the Apostle Paul. This is the Apostle, this is the guy, let me explain to you. This is the guy who was the Saddam Hussein of the early church, who killed Christians for a living. And yet God had such a plan for his life in spite of all the people he had slaughtered and murdered and destroyed. And some suggest that he even held the coat early on in his life while people stoned Stephen. He has a history of being a Christian killer and yet God touches him and converts him for the master's use. How could God use somebody so filthy, so nasty, so hateful? Uh, he basically called a terrorist. and put him on a street call straight and delivered him and turned him around and filled him up with the Holy Spirit and sent him out to do amazing things. Not because he was pure, not because he was holy, not because he was righteous, not because he had a wonderful past, not because he had not made horrendous mistakes, but, but even in his past life, he was a big guy who did big things in a big 
way. When he hated Christians, he wasn't two-faced about it. He said, I'm going to kill them. As soon as I get down to Jerusalem, I'm going to destroy them. He was bold. And God chose boldness over righteousness, over purity. Because he, he, he had the ability to function on a certain level and God used him. Now, you must understand that much of our New Testament theology is the result of the Apostle Paul. There would be no understanding. Yes, Jesus died and shed, the blood, shed his blood, rose from the dead and birthed the church. But the church that Jesus birthed was an organism with no organization. There was no structure. There was no order. There were no apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. Paul gives us all of that. Paul begins to teach us and make us understand there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk no longer after the flesh but after the spirit. Paul begins to tell us that if this earthly house or tabernacle shall be dissolved, we have another building eternal in the heavens which is made of God. Paul teaches us it is in him that we live, in him that we move, in him that we have our being. It is the apostle Paul that makes us understand. Therefore, having peace with God, that we are reconciled with him, we understand peace of God, peace with God, peace in God, all because of the apostle Paul. Without the apostle Paul, we would not have a clear understanding that the door to the Gentiles had been opened, that they might be saved and set free. Paul preached with so much power that a man died while he was preaching. Paul ran down the steps, raised him from the dead, and kept right on preaching. Paul was so awesome that they tried to kill him. They couldn't kill him. They tried to beat him to death. They left him from dead. He got up and shook himself and walked away. He was in shipwrecks, but he survived. He was snake bit, but he shook it off. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. That Paul that raised people from the dead withstood shipwrecks and shook off snakes. Why are you needing anything? If you can raise people from the dead, you can pay your water bill. <laughs> Paul says, the truth of the matter is, I am full, lacking nothing. But so that you might have credit to your account, God created a need to test you, to minister to that need. This is weird. In other words, Paul's saying, I needed something, but I didn't. I was in trouble, but I wasn't. It's kind of strange. This is the same guy that said, I have learned how to abase and abound, both to be full and to be in want. He says, he, he says even when you're in trouble, you're not in trouble. Now I need to preach this to somebody who's got some faith in them. Even when you're in trouble, you are not in trouble. That God allows certain necessities to come either to create a backdrop for you to experience another dimension of his glory or for the people around you to have an opportunity to flow into another dimension of his grace. Now, back in the early days, Dr. Jazz, when I was preaching, I would, I would, I would say something real hot and jazzy uh, as a subject. Uh, I would do something like tell you to touch your neighbor and say, it's a setup. So, touch your neighbor and tell them it's a setup. They, 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 they don't understand exactly what I'm saying yet because I'm not totally through unloading it yet. And when I unload it, everybody's not even going to get it because some people are so shocked by the situation and they've been praying so hard about the situation. They've been so focused on the circumstance. They've been so distracted by what they're going through that they don't understand that every 
everything you have been going through and every area you've been up under attack and every area that you have a necessity, your necessity is not a necessity. It is in fact a opportunity for you to experience another dimension of God's glory to the 10 people who understand it. Touch 10 people and say, it's a setup. It's training wheels for your faith. It's training wheels for your faith. It is the passage of entry into the next dimension. It is the bar mitzvah for the sons of God to have matured enough to carry the weight. Why didn't you give me this back then? I couldn't handle it back then. And why would he give me all of these thousands of seats when I didn't need them? <laughs> why would God give me something that I didn't need so is the embryo of my success the supply or the need the only thing that makes an answer important is the question The profundity of the question is built, the profundity of the answer is built on the profundity and the power of the question. Why would I answer what you didn't ask? If God says the trigger point of my supply is your need. No wonder he hates a proud look because a proud look will never admit need. I know I knocked out about 10 rows with that. I killed about 10 people with that. Why, why does God hate a proud look above everything else? Above, I mean, murderers and lying and backbiting and everything. God said, he hates, not only does he hate pride, he hates a proud look. You don't even have to be proud. He said, if you sit there and act like you're important, I hate the fact that you have got your legs crossed acting like you're important. Because proud people will never admit need. Why would you have a savior if you won't admit that you're drowning? Why would you have a miracle worker if you won't admit that you have a need? No wonder some people get anointed while some people are just tired. If God responds to need, if you don't need anything, you won't All the needy people, clap your hands. God says, let me see. I got, I got fish, I got stars, I got water, I got sunshine, I got oak trees, I got pineapple trees, I got all of this stuff that I want to give, but I cannot give it until there's a need. So he forms the earth. When he forms it, it creates a void. Void is capacity. And he responds to the capacity of what is formed. He said, I create capacity in the ocean so I can put fish in it. I created capacity in the earth so I could sow seed into it. I 
created capacity in the heavens so I could throw stars at it and birds at it. Now you got something to fly in. I couldn't release the answer until I formed. All right. All right. All right. He formed the earth and fills it. He forms the ocean and fills it with fish. He forms the air and fills it with birds. Everything God forms, he fills. He formed the tabernacle and filled it with furniture. He formed the holies of holies and then filled it with glory. In fact, he formed man and filled him with air. Which came first, the man or the breath? God had the breath, but until there was capacity, he couldn't feel anything until you admit, oh, y'all don't hear it. He responds to capacity. Ezekiel, go down and show me what you see in the valley. I see dry bones in the valley. He said, can these bones live again? Lord, thou knowest. Speak to the bones that they might live. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Suddenly there was a noise and there was a shaking. The bone came together, bone to his bone. And they came together, bone to his bone, and sinews came upon them. And then he said, prophesy to the wind. Because now I can feel what I form because God responds to capacity. If you don't want anything, you won't get anything. If you don't need anything, you won't receive anything. Do you not know that the real star of the story with the two fish and the five loaves of bread is not the little boy and it's not the lunch? It was the hunger that moved the Lord. When, the, when they came to Jesus and they said, the people that are with you are hungry, he said, oh good, that's capacity. Wherever I see capacity, I will release a plot. Oh, I want all the people that's got capacity to holler right now. They said, Lord, you got 5,000 hungry people. What do you have? He said, we don't have nothing but the little boy's lunch. He said, I can work with anything if they're hungry. I can work with anything if there's a need. I can work with anything if they're thirsty. I can work with anything. Just give me the little bit you got. I know it's not much because the star is not what's in the bag. The star is the aching in the belly of the people. God responds to hunger. The Bible said that when Jesus, after John the Baptist was beheaded, it said when Jesus saw the people and how they were hurt, he was moved with compassion and healed them. What I'm trying to tell you, your need to act like you don't need anything is stopping the flow of the miracle working power of God in your life. If you would shake your little cute dress down and say, Lord, I'm hungry. He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. No, 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 no. I don't want the cute people to say nothing. I want the people who came down here saying, God, if you don't do something for me at Woman Now I Loose, I don't know what I'm going to do for the next two minutes. I want you to let your daddy know you are. 